Well, thank you, Amina and Imina, for letting me present today. A great opportunity for me to learn and uh, for you guys to learn as well from me, I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have no conflict of interest, except I do love sleep. And I hope some of you love sleep, too. It's very important. Uh, so the learning objectives are many, but just to highlight a few of them, we're going to try to identify and understand risk factors that are related to sleep disorder, breathing, especially in pediatrics. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a little bit of different types of pediatric, pediatric sleep disorder breathing, mainly obstructive sleep apnea, central. Central sleep apneas are several, uh, even though we generalize them as central sleep apnea, but I'm going to talk about a different one just so that from a pediatric standpoint, how do you, those terminologies interact with each other. And then another unique sleep disorder, disordered breathing called catheterhemia, which uh, was not in the category of sleep disordered breathing until in the last few years. So I want to briefly mention that because it can mimic in a different manner. So mechanism of breathing, just to brief, airway should always remain open throughout the respiratory cycle. Uh, the uh, airway includes the upper airway, which is the nasal cavities, the pharynx, the larynx, and the intrathoracic and extrathoracic components also play viral role, uh, vital role in the trachea, the larynx, and the ph pharyngeal airway. And the pediatric or younger population or other disease organisms uh, related problems, so like pharyngeal airways do not always have the rigid support. So they have the collapsibility or neuromuscular disorders like hypotonia or syndromes uh, that creates a problem and creates an imbalance. So sleep disordered breathing, generalized term, for, um, is characterized by the disruption in this normal breathing pattern with or without inadequate oxygenation. So you can have desaturations, you may not have desaturations, you may have or may not have ventilation problems, um, and symptoms also include snoring, sometimes, sometimes you can have mouth breathing, and then upper airway resistance and apnea. So what is the prevalence? Uh, one to five percent of children worldwide Actually, I tried to do a research on what is in Bosnia, and I could not find it. So the World Health Organization did not even have data on it. Uh, but I think it's underestimated, right, because it's not diagnosed adequately. Uh, it increases up to 7 to 16 percent when snoring is included in children. The snoring is common. Snoring does not equal to sleep apnea. Uh, but it is common, but it does increase the risk of it if there is a presence of it. Usually sleep apnea will uh, peak around the age of two to eight. Tonsils and adenoids tend to have a peak growth around five to six, seven, so I think that's why we probably have this time range um, when it peaks. Clinical symptoms, snoring, gasping, daytime sleepiness, uh, hyperactivity, irritability, uh, mental health, which I didn't mention, headaches, you know, the neurologist nightmare. <laughs> Uh, impaired academic performance, which is what we kind of thrive in children, or growth impairment, a failure to thrive, or secondary aneurysis that you'll see. Um, additional risk factors, adenoids and tonsils, hypertrophy is the number one cause or risk factor. Like I said, peak growth between four and nine. Obesity, unfortunately, in our country is becoming a second one. Um, and then other craniofacial anomalies, which, you know, Advance in medicine, advance in genetic testing allows us to diagnose these children with craniofacial anomalies, uh, syndromes, and so we get into this more complex medical system where all these other sleep apnea is becoming more and more prevalent, and we tend to recognize and diagnose and treat. Uh, and neuromuscular disorders, like because of their hypotonia. And I'm happy to uh, share any of this information if you're interested uh, or you want. Okay. It is stuck. Oh, there you go. So how do we evaluate for sleep apnea? Again, like we talked about earlier, physical exam. History and physical is your driving most powerful tool we clinicians have. Uh, tonsillar size, airway crowding, um, tongue ridging. Do they have oropharyngeal abnormalities, jaw positioning, craniofacial, hypotonia, dentition is an important, and nasal. You know, we'll see kids who have a cold, they just had a recent cold, or unfortunately something that created this nasal congestion and suddenly they're having apnea. So looking into those uh, factors. And then how do we diagnose officially is of course a sleep study. Not every center has a sleep study. Not every center does pediatric sleep studies. But 
Sleep studies are what we use. We use the what do we call obstructive apnea hypopnea index graded at 1.5 per hour, so the number, one and a half event per hour of sleep. And or if there is hypercapnia or there is significant desaturation. Those are some parameters we will use in conjunction with just the AHI number. So when do you do the testing? Okay. Indication again, based on history and physical. You wanna, if there's somebody already had an enlarged tonsils and they went through a uh, tonsillar surgery and the sleep apnea was really, really bad, you wanna see what's the residual uh, disease uh, left over and do we need to address that. Um, Post-procedure, right, we talked about that. And pap therapy, if I have to have somebody go through a CPAP or a BiPAP treatment, then usually we'll go ahead and send them back to the lab to do the titration because what pressure will the sleep apnea get treated? Oxygen titration, very crucial in pediatric. We don't just nearly, nearly just throw somebody on oxygen. You have to do a titration. And I have actually a very interesting case I want to talk about at the end. There are a couple of cases that I will kind of bring all this information together. And when you have tracheostomy, so we have a protocol. So somebody has a tracheostomy and the outpatient world, the multidisciplinary team will decide if the patient is able to wean on their settings. They'll bring their BiPAP, CPAP settings down up to a point but then you don't go further without doing a sleep study to make sure you know, they can tolerate it, it's capped, and then, then they uncap it and then see how they tolerate before the tracheostomy comes out. So there's a process that goes through. Growth hormone therapy, Prader-Willi syndrome. Children who tend to get on growth hormone, Prader-Willi actually specifically has a protocol. So they all get a, a sleep study the minute they get diagnosed with the Prader-Willi and they get initiated on growth hormone. They follow another sleep study about six weeks after the growth hormone therapy started to make sure those tonsils and adenoids have not significantly grown. And if that's stable, then they get it annually. So that's the protocol they do in Prater Willie. So we do a lot of these sleep studies for them. So. Uh, oh, I did get that. And then home studies are not FDA approved in, chill, uh, in a pediatric population. There are some uh, thoughts about do doing clinical trials on looking at age 16, age 17, 18, but as of right now, home sleep studies are not indicated in pediatric population. Uh, so how do we diagnose, and I'm gonna put all of these here. So these are, so you may come across a report or you may come across a word terminology that says hypopneas, obstructive apneas, or central apneas, what do those mean? So this is the uh, scoring protocol that we use. So if you look at the anatomy, now this is your oropharynx right here. If you have obstruction here, those have a 30% reduction in the flow, those are considered hypopneas. Those, those are specific criteria. Obstructive is airway, obstructed right here. There's complete pause here, but your chest and your abdomens are still functioning. Central is everything shuts off, right? And those are protocols. You can have central apneas in babies. Nick, your babies will come and say, <gasps> They have a pause, but if they're less than 20 seconds, okay, yeah. But again, also depends on the percent of it. So again, I wrap it up with a couple of cases that will be very informative. This is a summary of my our grading. What do we call uh, severity of uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea? AHI 1.45 to 4, and the DSATs. In adults, sleep apnea is diagnosed with AHI greater than 5. So there's a big. So the kids who are 17 who are transitioning to adult program, it's a big problem. So you got a kid with obesity, for example, and their AHI was, let's say, 4.5, and they're about to turn 18 next month. Guess what happened? They went to a different program. Insurance like, 4.5 is normal. I'm not covering your sleep CPAP machine. So that window of opportunity gets lost, and that buy-in from the family say, hey, you got a kid with symptoms, you have an HI of 4.5, I wanna treat that sleep apnea, but you're turning 18 next month, I need to see you now if you want this treatment. So there are these little finagling room that you have to use to convince families on where that window of opportunity is present. So treatment options, uh, of course, number one is adenoid tonsillarectomy. Uh, success rate varies. Uh, Sometimes kids who have partial response to the traditional tonsils adenoidectomy, 
We have certain ENT physicians who kind of specialize in what they call lingual. So they'll go back and they'll do a lingual tonsillectomy where if there's a bulking of the tongue, they debulk the tongue at the posterior area. Uh, depends on other uh, anomalies, they'll do um, tongue lip adhesions. I've not seen one, but basically they'll kind of take the tip of the tongue and attach it to the inferior part of the lip inside. So basically you're keeping the tongue projected out. So you're not collapsing the airway in the back, like you're not obstructing it. Mandibular distraction is very common in our program. We do a lot of them. So kids with the Pierre Robin, severe cases, they'll take them, they'll get a sleep study before because the ENT plastics want to know the degree of sleep apnea. Then they'll go to the OR and get their uh, mandibular distractors and they'll crank them up and then about a month later, they'll want us to do the sleep study again to see, hey, how much did we improve? And some of the studies are amazing. The resolution is just phenomenal. And I have actually a 16 year old right now who actually had this procedure as a baby. The kid still has residual sleep apnea, but anatomically, it's just phenomenal, except they have a little couple of scars here, right? from it, but. Uh, low flow oxygen support, you know, CPAPs are challenging, so sometimes we'll bridge the gap with the low flow oxygen support, uh, and then CPAP therapy. CPAP therapy is the most, after tonsillectomy, usually the CPAP is the primary therapy, if you can do it. Positional therapy is another great option. Those who will not go for CPAP, especially when their uh, availability is limited, Positional therapy is a good alternative therapy. And of course, finally, weight loss. If there's a room for margin, 10% of weight loss can significantly lower your sleep apnea uh, degree. So, uh, but it's a sensitive topic about weight, right? Um, so then we're gonna go over to central sleep apnea. Um, it's, uh, there's a primary central sleep apnea of prematurity or infancy, we have just primary sleep apnea, which is basically can't find the diagnosis or underlying cause. Uh, central sleep apnea associated with medical condition, uh, Arnold Chiari malformation, stuff like that. Uh, and then treatment emergent central sleep apnea. This is when do no harm. Sometimes we want to do something, but we actually in, in try to fix something, we create another problem. <laughs> so, but I don't talk a lot about these because of the time uh, constraint, but we can definitely talk about it after the lecture if needed. How do you distinguish uh, prematurity or infancy central sleep apnea? Basically, what is central sleep apnea, right? So significant numbers of prolonged or recurrent apneic events that are associated with desaturations or bradycardia. Uh, what, what is significant? Greater to equal to 5% of the night of periodic breathing. Okay, what is periodic breathing? Pauses. They have three second pauses in a, in a pattern. But if you just have 4% of it, that's normal. So sometimes when you see a baby, my, my baby paused. Okay, well, how often did you try? Nobody can count the seconds, right? If your child is not breathing, you're going to panic. You're not going to say one, two, three, four. So you ask the fair, did you, did you count? No. <laughs> so they're worried. So then, you know, sometimes you're like, okay, certain percent is okay, but what is associated with it to make it a concern? So central sleep apnea of prematurity, we define it if they are born bef before 37 weeks. Infancy, if you're over 37 weeks, right? So the definition varies, but the diagnosis and the treatment is pretty much similar. About 10% of preterm infants and about 5% of term infants will have periodic breathing. But again, that greater than 5% is the critical piece here. Uh, and it tends to resolve by 44 weeks. So it's the bridging of that small gap, that one, two months of those babies that we just need to support them a little bit. Uh, and then of course, caffeine in the NICU, um, usually they will not call us to assess for sleep apnea until after they're weaned off the caffeine, right? Because you've got to let that phase go. But let's say they weaned off the caffeine, they're still having sleep apnea, that's when the sleep specialist gets called to evaluate for sleep apnea. And again, the treatment, like I said earlier, was uh, low flow oxygen. So what are the other medical conditions that can 
be associated with central sleep apnea or you look for reflux. Um, oh, press it down. Neurological condition, like we talked about Arnold uh, Chiari malformation, seizure disorder, infections, ingestions, cardiac disease, particularly in adults, we can see congestive heart failure in pediatrics, some of the cardiac anomalies. We'll see those, they may have it, or cardiomyopathy, stuff like that. And stroke. But I think stroke more true in adults, but I have a case of a sickle cell disease individual with Down syndrome, uh, too many unluck cards for this kid, who actually had two strokes. And so the neurologist sent the patient to me to try to get their sleep, uh, sleep apnea treated. Hard time to take a Down syndrome individual with sickle cell disease and two strokes to convince this family to pap. Tried, failed, so he's on a low flow oxygen. You know, whatever I can do to keep that strokes from causing problems more. So these are the two cases I really wanna highlight. So this is a 15 day old male, born term, comes to the emergency room after about a week of being at home and stops breathing or has his pauses and the parents are freaked out, brings the kid in, very good family, second child. So they, so they are in the hospital service, we get consulted, I happen to be the consult on that day, I go see the baby, cutest little baby, looks perfectly fine. It's a healthy looking kid, physical exam says negative. So then I got, I got a diagnostic sleep study. And what I see here, how many of you have seen a hypnogram before? Okay, so I'm gonna go over it, that's why I put it in here actually. So these red bars are the dream sleep. In a baby, 50% of your sleep is dream sleep. In adults, about 20%. As we get older, we tend to have it between 20 to 25 percent, but most of us lose. So this is a th stage three sleep. These bars, growth hormone is produced in the stage three sleep. As we get older, we kind of have less and less of the stage three. What's the only way to bring a little bit of the stage three sleep, which is the most protective sleep? Exercise. So as we get older, we tend to need to exercise more and not have that weight get, get in. So this is very important, same thing here. This is the same kid, uh, didn't give me much sleep, but a good, good amount, but about 50% of the sleep. So this is the dream sleep. This is the stage three sleep. A Lot of fragmentation. This is my oxygen levels. Look at the dips, you see those dips? Drops, boom, boom, boom. This is my apnea scores. These are my events. Look at these events. Look at the cluster. So there's the dream sleep on the back, Desatting big time events and goes down, right? So this pattern. So obstructive sleep apnea or sleep apnea is most common in dream supine sleep. So this kid follows the pattern. Okay, you know, he's a term baby, 15 day old. He's probably just hypotonic. I just need to give him a little bit of time and he'll get better. So. I do the right thing that I know, I'm gonna to try to titrate him on a little bit of oxygen. So here, guess what? These events, pretty much gone. So guess what? I fixed him, right? No, I created a problem. Watch this mark right here. So this kid, if you look at these bumps, this is the transcutaneous monitoring for my carbon dioxide. If you look, there's a little bit bump, very subtle, so I'm like, Maybe this is a technical problem. This is technology, right? I, they, they can have faults. So then, but what happened is, look at this, the bump got worse. Now, but the other information that I found was, it's not happening in the REM sleep. So the bump should occur in the REM sleep, but this is happening in the stage three sleep or the non-REM sleep. I think I created a problem. Did I really create a problem? Or did I unmask a new diagnosis, right? This is cool. So this became a mixed sleep apnea. Got a little bit of obstructive, a little bit of central, but I'm doing something weird. This baby's doing something weird. The baby looks great, fine. Well, what turned out? Congenital central hypoventilation syndrome. Rare phenomena, but a bad disease if you have it. So it's a genetic mutation. 
they're reported about 1,000 cases in the world, but I think it's underdiagnosed because it's rare. 92% um, of these people have uh, what's called polyalanine repeats. The greater the repeats, the worse the disease, and it's get diagnosed earlier. So if you have a milder mutation or less repeats, you may pick them up into adolescent. They may just fly through the childhood phase. As they get a little older, you might notice more of, more of this. So this hap unfortunately happened to be when a very young kid that got diagnosed. Treatment is usually uh, continuous me mechanical ventilation. Remember, I tried low flow oxygen, I made things worse. If anything, actually, uh, it unmasked a diagnosis that was kind of hiding there somewhere. So when I did a third study without the oxygen, that obstruction went away because now the kid is two weeks older. So now he's a month old, the hypotonia went away, right? He got a little stronger, muscles started working better, the obstructor went away, but this doesn't go away. So, uh, so we actually ended up sending the kid home on BiPAP, thrived. And then, uh, and then if you have this disease, there are other associated the process, pro, uh, mutation that cause her spring, so you kind of keep an eye out for those. Um, and so reflux seizures are associated with bad cases. Um, like I said, late onsets will occur after one month of age. This happened to be the earlier onset. And so these are just more information. There's another syndrome called Rohan. I have not seen one yet, but I'm still young in the world of sleep medicine, I think, in my practice. So it's a rapid onset obesity, hypothalamic dysfunction, hypoventilation, and autonomic dysfunction. And usually this population has Fox gene negativity. Uh, I'm always looking for one. Every time I see somebody, I'm like, oh, maybe they have that, and I haven't found one yet. <laughs> but, so here's the second case. A 15-year-old with a BMI of 35, obesity, snoring, gasping. I've never laid eyes on this kid, okay? So I've not, this is a kid that came through a primary care office, they wanted a sleep study on this child. The, the kid gets the sleep study. I happen to be the one reading that day. And my tech calls me and she said, you know, Dr. Patel, I am so sorry, but I'm having a hard time scoring this study. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I just want to let you know that I think I'm struggling with it. I said, okay. So I read through the study. So this is what I want to point out to you guys is, this is the respiratory part of what earlier I showed you on that hypnogram. Breathe, 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 complete pause. So this is where I would score hypopneas. That red line is where I would score obstructive events. This is my chest and abdomen belts. No breathing, flat. Breathe, flat, breathe, flat, right? But the other thing is oxygen does not drop. You see that? There's no desaturation. The carbon dioxide, the transcutaneous consistently stays beautiful. What the heck is going on? Okay, I'm like puzzled. And remember, I have no history, I have no physical. So I'm like, something is not right. So I turn on the video, the, the audio, and I hear this machinery sound. <laughs> oh, what the heck? Now I'm watching this kid breathe. So I'm like, hmm, I have a suspicion of something. So I actually call the parents. I said, I'm the doctor who's reading your child's sleep study, don't panic. I just have some additional questions because I have a suspicion of a diagnosis. I want to know if I'm right or wrong. So they gave me the information. And so by the way, this could also represent periodic breathing. All of this, this is basically periodic breathing, kind of in a baby. They would not have a DSAT. If you have DSAT, 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 that's central apnea. But I'm not seeing that here, right? And this is 15-year-old. 15-year-olds should not have periodic breathing, so this is not right. Periodic breathing, usually most of the kids will lose it within their five years, within a year, usually it's gone, or even younger. So, oh, backwards, catheterinia. What is catheterinia? Sleep disorder breathing pattern characterized by expiratory groaning, moaning sound. Rawr. But parents will bring and say, I think my kid has stopped breathing, has sleep apnea. Person takes a deep breath, holds it, and then exhales with this high-pitched sound. It's scary, actually. And it's extremely disturbing to the partners or the family members. And actually, patients will have fatigue or daytime sleepiness. 
Uh, our episodes are observed without respiratory distress. They have normal oxygenation. And it's a predominant in REM sleep, but in rare cases, it could be non-REM. Now, it, co it can coexist with obstructive sleep apnea. So this patient had obstructive sleep apnea, but he also had this. So you treat the obstructive sleep apnea with your CPAP. The idea is with the CPAP, the catheterinia will also improve. The problem with insurance, if you do not have obstructive sleep apnea and all you have is catheterinia, insurance will not cover your PAP therapy. So you've got to have a little bit of obstruction. If you treat the obstructive sleep apnea, if they have the criteria met for the PAP therapy, go for it, treat it, put this kid on CPAP, loved it, flew through it. Then he stopped using it. <laughs> so what are the take home messages, guys? Pediatric sleep issues are not the same as adults. In children, daytime sleepiness may not be present. You've got to look for these other symptoms and clues. And it may present with just developmental or behavior issues, right? They may just present with mental health issues. They may just have ADHD. Wait a minute, are we treating ADHD with stimulant but we're not getting better? Maybe there's something else going on. Uh, or, you know, milestone, loss of milestones, or they're not progressing in development like they should. Think about sleep apnea. Uh, size of the tonsils and adenoids may not correlate with the disease severity. And I have experienced this day in and day out. Patients will come from the ENT office. ENTs on my exam will say, oh, tonsils are two plus. But the severity of the sleep apnea may be significant. On the flip side, I'll, I'll examine tonsils that are three plus, mild sleep apnea, right? But it's, it's putting everything together is what's gonna help you. Brief central pauses, like I said, less than 20 seconds, may desat, no desat, no arousals, are common in preterm and term infants. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you for having me over. And this is my email address if you ever want to email me with information or if you want additional information or share my slides. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>